from Facebook. So I can see when you comment on there, sometimes it's a bit tricky. So yeah, I've got my airbrush booth is there and you can see already I have some containers lined up ready to do the next stage on them. They've really only had, um, Oh, hi, John. Yeah, thanks. Oh, well, hang around as long as you like. And uh, if there's anything of interest, please ask questions while I'm working through. So, um, yeah, those are some 15 mil sci-fi containers and I've put them on there so that they're going to act as a sort of container yard. Um, I've got various bits on there that still need doing. I need to do another tone of color on the red and on the blue. The green all have already had a highlight, so they just need weathering. So really, I want to get it to a stage where I don't need to do any more airbrushing on it. And the same applies for this, as in it's had quite a lot of airbrushing already, but I need to finish off the colours so that I can get on to, you know, doing much more detail work. And by detail, I mean... Um, I can then get, get into all of the areas like uh, these barrels, um, these containers that I've glued in there to just make it a little, little bit more interesting and pop. I said before, just a general conversation piece here on this, um, that um, the previous ones of these that I did, it's, it, it, the intention is to not try and make it too eye candy-ish because, for example, I could go on here, I could paint every one of those little bottles in a different colour show you those up close actually so you can get a good view on the rooftop. I could go in there as I was saying and paint all of these different candy bright colours and the problem with that is that it would start to look a bit overwhelming I think so in some parts you want to try and keep some strong theme colours. Some bits that pop out a bit there's a kind of console thing here and obviously I need to weather things like these vents that I've glued on but generally speaking I don't want to go overboard when I'm doing these. You can see I've gone for the two-tone grey and white all arrayed around this building and the same applies to the doors on there too. They've had like a couple of different airbrushes on on there and I've got to paint that logo so I won't be airbrushing the wording that's been laser cut and put on there. I'll just that three-letter abbreviation DCE I'll just uh, paint those when I get around to that stage. So yeah, that's generally it. Um, what I've got to do now is I've got to get all the base to a consistent sort of grey. I've got to clean up any overspray that's come around the edges here as well. So those oversprays are needed to be tidied up. And that will be just done by putting a piece of card up against there and then spraying a dark grey on the ground areas. And um, I mean, all of this area is done, as in it's got its highlight, it's got its primary green underneath it and it will just need weathering now, which I do by brush. So that's that done. Just taken delivery of um, some very nice decal um, for railway models. And obviously you can see a container on there and it's telling you exactly where to put the Maersk um, logos and stars. This is, I believe, N scale. No, yeah, N scale, these micro scale ones. So these are N, which makes them rather small. But they'll look neat. I mean, that's appropriate for 15 mil, and I'm not going to follow the pattern because, you know, I'm not a model railroad uh, kind of person that wants everything to be super accurate. And uh, instead, I just want to splash these over. I might put them on the end, tail end, like that, because obviously a lot of those are exposed. If you look at the... Um, uh, airbrush you can see the ends of the containers are exposed so they will take a, a logo on there one of these decals but the big words I'm going to put on the side um, yeah so these ones I'll put on the side visible um, where where the side of the containers aren't sort of butted up against another one again I'll not follow the instructions strictly for that and they also had this company um, what's that microscale decals they're called I think they're in California. And they also did various other little safety warning signs, so I grabbed those at the same time and just think those would look great everywhere, either on the side of those containers or the, um, or the buildings that I'm doing too. 
So that, I don't know if I'll get around to doing these later today um, because I'll be doing the airbrushing and weathering. But I think I'd like to put them on before I do a lot of the air, the, the sort of weather um, rusting and things like that with washes. I'd put those on before so that the the decal itself is getting a bit weathered and a bit obscured and scratched up, what have you. Um, so yeah, that's the plan. That's the final stage. This is the sort of icing on the cake um, when they're done. But I thought I'd just show those arrived this morning in the post here in Sussex. And who else is on there? John. Yeah, so okay. Oh, got two new comments. About to climb on my shed roof. Darn, how hot is it out there at the moment to climb on shed roofs? Um, so, right, back to me, and, um, no, that's not me, that's it, GoPro, so, yeah, I better get started, um, it's going to get hot, I'm going to get all ugh, sweaty over there, I've got a mask, um, obviously I need to put the extractor fan on, which is tucked over there, and um, I'll be moving to the other mic as well, so I'll just this mic will mute in a moment before I shift over there and start uh, just working through. It's really just a really is a sweatshop uh, here today to get these done. So uh, mask on, oh, which is always a tricky thing. Of course, what happens immediately when you get this on is I start sounding a little bit muffled, and also there's a risk of steamage on the old uh, glasses. So anyway, yeah, better go over to the other one. I'll get the airbrush uh, picture primed so there it is and I'm now going to mute this mic well hopefully you heard that clip I'm now over at the airbrush booth. Here I am. Is that zoomed in or zoomed out? It's zoomed out. So, yes, yeah, so I'll start with the containers since they are the simplest because I can just very easily mask off sections when I'm spraying on there. Uh, so I tend to try and start my airbrushing with, uh, with a simple job because, you know, who wants to um, dive straight in on trying to do some detail work because I need to get my hand and eye coordination working. At my age, those kind of uh, things take time to warm up, even though it's a warm day today. And uh, just what I'm doing over here is I'm trying to that's it, just make sure I've got a video stream of what I'm doing. Available on show here. Well, maybe it's the same, so that's what I'm doing. Oh, looks like it is. This is a bit disappointing, the sound over here, actually. Let me just talk a bit louder and see what's coming in. Yeah, unfortunately it looks like I've got a bit of background hiss on this mic, so you know, I'll try my best to talk loud and clear while I'm here, but I'm just going to start loading up the airbrush. So basically what I've got is a HPC Plus airbrush, and it... And um, the has a reservoir, gravity-fed reservoir on the top. I've got one of these exposed crown style um, crowns, which allows me to get up close to the topic at hand. And I'm connected to a silent, Bambi silent compressor, which I'm using for the uh, compression of air through here. So what I normally always do with these is I crack off to start with, with um, just a drop or two of airbrush flow improver in there before I start anything else. 
uh, just because I like to make sure the first thing sort of going through into the reservoir is just clean. Obviously, I'm going to stir that up as well, but I like to sort of kick off with that. And then I'm just looking at what colour I'm going to highlight here. And on this older red, I'm going to use just an orange, um, but I'm going to go on with it um, very lightly, just as a light um, um, trim around the sort of edges to sort of highlight it. I'm not going to go on too heavy with that. Um, the other thing I'm going to do after that probably is use this tan to do the little um, skip there, the sort of trash skip, garbage skip on the side. So I'm going to do a sort of base of a light tan over it, then I'm going to go over with um, yellow. I just The yellow won't go very well onto the dark, so if I go on with the tan first and then a the yellow, uh, that will then come up quite nicely. And um, the blues. I was going to use a dark blue on the blues. I've got a or a grey. I'm not 100% sure what to do on that. That's the one colour I haven't. Yeah, I've got this colour here called blue. Blue angel blue. I'm going to stick that on to sort of darken some of this Maersk blue down a little bit. Not a lot, but I'll darken that. So essentially, I'm highlighting the red, but I'm going to darken some areas on the Maersk blue there, which I'm going to put those decals on that I showed earlier, the water slide ones. So right, I've put in some, a couple of drops of Flow Enhancer, now I'm going to get that orange, give it another final shake up. I did pre-shake, I'm so prepared today, I pre-shook some of my uh, bottles. So Orange Fire, this is called Game Colour Air Colour. Right, so I have got some red on the other um, bases, so I'm going to use quite a little few drops of the the orange to give me some spare to s over spray onto some of the other bases because I know I've got some red areas that I'll touch up as well. Then I use some um, mecha varnish, which just gives it a slight shine and means that when you do your weathering, it um, ensures that the um, paint surface smooth to allow the capillary action to take place. And then finally the other absolutely vital ingredient, which I always say whenever doing airbrushing, you can't airbrush if you haven't got a cocktail stick to hand because they're just great for everything to do with airbrushing, like picking bits of paint off the, off the airbrush, stirring it, and just everything you need to do. So yeah, it's in there, it's had, it's, it's dripping, it's had a few um, drops of the flow improver. If anybody asks me exactly what the ratio is, I don't know. I just judge it every time. And generally speaking, obviously it varies every time too. So one thing I'm missing here is I am missing the, uh, a white piece of tissue paper. And the importance of white tissue paper is just that when you spray, you want to see the colour cleanly, so I tend to sort of put that down there. Uh, these little things here are fridge magnets, which I got when I was in Japan, and they are great for, because this is a metal surface here, great for sort of just keeping things in place, especially when you're doing one of these videos. Right, that's it. So the airbrush is loaded up. Let's see how it's, how it's spraying. Nothing. <laughs> This isn't, this isn't a good sign. I just need a moment of letting some air through to, to get things rolling. Here it comes. <laughs> there it is. So that's that nice yellowy orange in there, orange fire. And that's what I'm going to touch up this with. I can see actually unfortunately I'm getting a little bit of flakage from the, the fact that these have been around a few weeks. They will need sealing properly in the end but uh, here we go. I'm going to turn the noisy compressor on now. Sorry not compressor, extractor. Here it comes. Mask on.
So you may be able to see or not see, I don't know, but it's a, a gentle increase in colour on the side there. I'm just using this piece of old card to just to block overspill from spraying down. It's not vital. Oh, so John has said, I've just shared to a friend of mine who's casting 6mm Byzantium model buildings for me. Hurst Moulds, oh nice. Obviously just going around these gently. A couple of passes it increases the, the colour as it uh, highlights on there. I'm not looking for a drastic result obviously and it doesn't need to be perfect either. So here are the ends. I'm just spraying over the top of those. So that's built up quite a layer to sort of highlight the top. You can see how gloss they are. So that's gonna that's gonna do for this. So this piece has um, red in in the form of this ladder, which I'll just touch the, the top areas of that with this colour. Not heading for a really bright difference, but just enough to, to break up the tone a bit when the weathering goes on here. Stop it all looking like one colour.
So I've just gone down the centre of the steps. You can see the shine off it there. So that's going to do. I mean, the only other thing is I could potentially just stick a blast on the top of this red barrel. Yep, that's fine. This one doesn't have much. I actually have already highlighted the uh, the container in there that was red. So this one doesn't need any extra red. Or yellow, as it had to be. So there you go. I've done that, and I've suddenly realized I probably had too much paint. So I'm going to have to be pouring a lot of that out, unfortunately. But my cleaning technique is just to pour it out and then use the, uh, the pump spray, water spray, just to shift what's in there. And that sort of cleans it out instantly. There'll still be paint to flow through, which at this stage, I can just spray it through. And that'll be quite sort of clean now in there. I can see there's some gunk build up in there, but I, I'll clean that later. So next color, that's the red done. I'm just gonna hit a couple of things with this tan. I don't need much of it. There are a couple of small details that I want to do yellow but I'm going to put this on as a base before I put the yellow onto it. That's a bit gunked up. That is handy about these Vallejo paints is that they are dropper based so you can go straight in with them, particularly for airbrushing. I mentioned the last, um, the last video I did that um, they're really convenient because you can use them um, one-handed, essentially. You, well, you can remove the lid one-handed. If I was using one hand, I can, uh, if you're holding an airbrush or you've got something awkward in your hand, you can take that lid off and throw it away uh, to pick up later one-handed, which is convenient. Bit of a train spotterish like detail though. So a bit more of the varnish in there. And maybe a couple more drops. Then a cocktail stick and just very small amount in the bottom there. Yep, so very thin small amount there. And that's coming through straight away. So a couple of things I wanted to do with this tan, I'll probably start with a little gentle bit on this, these wooden, um, pallets down there, just to sort of line up the edge of them, there you go. And then I've got, um, a trash skip container hidden away in there. So I don't want that to uh, overspray. So I just happen to have a, a little bit of card, pop that in there. Obviously I will overspray sideways, but that helps me not go on the blue building.
So yeah, the, you can punch quite a small detail with the airbrush uh, without too much overspray or damage on anything else. That's fine. And uh, that's going to go yellow afterwards. So that's this one done for that colour. Uh, don't intend to use that colour anymore there. It's worth looking around where you might use a colour again. Um, and I can see there's little tiny details on this one that look like little wooden boxes. So I'm just doing those in that, that tan colour too, because they'll, they'll sort of dry brush up as, um, and weather up as like little wooden slatted bits. another one tucked away in there. Yeah, just picking those small details out. So back to this one again, and you can see on the, s there's the skip. Back to needing a card. This skip is 3D printed, uh, it's from Brigade Models in the UK. Uh, very fine detail, obviously it's been printed from a, one of those online services that do the 3D printing and then Tony from Brigade Models sells them on his website and at trade shows somewhat difficult getting in underneath there, but I'm not too worried about perfection. After all, it is a skip. So one thing here, just a note about airbrushing in general, uh, where I've gone in there and I've left some dark patches, when I go over with a brighter yellow, that dark will shine through and it will just look like a different tone of colour or shadow. And uh, so yeah, I don't bother punching every little tiny bit of detail in there because it naturally leaves some shade around that bit where there's some rocky, rocky bits on there. I don't know what to do about these. Um, I'm trying to work out whether I make them wooden or not. If I do, I need to do a sort of brown base coat on them. Um, so that might come next. Right. So I think that's my full use of this. And again, I've left a little drop in there. Seems a shame I haven't really got anything else to spray it with, but there you go, I'll get rid of it. This airbrush is getting uh, close to a point where it needs a proper deep clean. Uh, which I will do soon. But not during the video, obviously. So that's clean. A little bit of splat still in there. Yeah, so this is the Iwata HPC Plus. Uh, heavily used by modelers in the 135th scale wargaming. Right, next. Do I go over with a yellow? I think I'm going to use a darker brown to do those, yeah, so I'll use this 
a green brown to do those box details on the top of the containers. So they're very small. I need to tell myself only use a very small amount of uh, paint. So again, straighten the airbrush with the flow enhancer first, just my technique. Just like to put something liquid in through to drag the paint through rather than getting it clogged up straight away. So there you go, example of one-handed use of the paint bot bottles, very handy. I know there's been a lot of news recently about um, Games Workshop paints and how you might um, prevent them from tipping over or use them because they have unusual um, lids, don't they? They're not, um, it's not too easy to get your paint out if you're trying to, for example, get it into a airbrush at all. That would be a bit of a tricky job to do. So again, cocktail stick, always use a cocktail stick for the mixing in here. It's never done them any harm, I've done this for eight years. Um, just make sure that paint is nicely stirred. And that's what the reservoir's for, you know, use it. So I've got that sort of tan in there. Get some of these things out of the way, which I've been leaving out there. Check that's coming through. So there's that nice tan brown. Now I need to get the object to spray. Here we go. So yeah, I'm just going to do these two um, details in the same colour, sort of boxes left behind on the top. Don't want to make them bright colours because the whole thing would look like a, you know, candy jar if I. Um, If I did these in bright colours as well, yes, it would all look like a candy jar, so you don't want that. Really annoyingly heavy, this, because it's made of resin, all these uh, little containers. Quite hard to manoeuvre. I think I mentioned before, overspray is not a big deal. Um, you can always tidy it up. As long as you've not done a massive amount of overspray, where you've completely covered something that you didn't want to. Yeah, so these will be just done up as sort of dirty old boxes that someone's thrown on the top of here. Maybe they had ordnance in them at some point. And um, they're now put out of the way onto the top of the roof. And they'll weather up with a dry brush and some washes on there. So, I'm nearly, I'm nearly there with this. I'm feeling good about getting close to the edge, but I need to get that darker blue on here as well. Right, I generally don't think I've got any other use again for that colour in the airbrush. Spray some water through. The benefit of using one of these scenic sprayers 
uh, and a pump is that you've got some pressure on your, your pumping into there and it, that just shifts the paint out nicely. If you don't have one, you could just swirl some paint around in there. I mean, some water even. And uh, a tip from me is don't don't use cleaners through your airbrush until you're um, you're done for the day, really, because they tend to clog up. And I learned that in my first year or two. I've been airbrushing now for a about nine or ten years and my first year or two I used to put cleaner through sometimes in between paint I think I'd go oh just to keep the things moving I put some cleaning fluid in the problem with that is the next time you put uh, acrylic in the clean any cleaning fluid left reacts with this and turns it into a sludge and you end up with more blockage by using cleaning fluid which sounds counterintuitive but uh, you know, big tip is don't use cleaning fluid until you're at the point when you're really done and you want to you want to properly clean the airbrush out at the end of the day. Um, or if you've got a blockage, perhaps that's built up. But um, I would avoid cleaning fluid until you're really through the day and use a, a a pump to just spray everything out from there. It cleans it out nicely. Right, next colour then. So I think that dark blue on the Nursk blue. Uh, which is on the containers. So that's blue angel blue. This one feels nice and when you shake pots you can sort of get a judgment, you judge you know how clogged up is it in there. And this feels nice and loose as a paint. So as usual straight in to the reservoir with some airbrush flow enhancer I'm a chemist and um, I'm not a chemist, I'm just pretending to be a chemist mixing these paints. Trying to not go on too heavy but I ended up putting lots in but we'll see. And then obviously the mecha varnish again to give it a gloss which helps with the weathering stage. I'll put lots of that on too. Find a clean cocktail stick. Mention again. Never stop mentioning <laughs> that cocktail sticks are great. Um, stirring up your airbrush reservoir. That's nice and thin, and that's how I want this because I don't want to go this. I don't want to really darken down that Maersk blue. Now for once, I'm going to put the lid on. You don't have to do that, but yeah, I've just done it. So here's an interesting patch. I can see I've got overspray underneath here from when I was doing the little container. So that's a good target for using some of that blue. Because that will clean up the overspray for me. And that's quite dark, so I'm going to have to be careful with that. And I went in a bit close there too, but obviously, let's see how I get on. And that's where this being a light airbrush that I've got in there, as in I've thinned it down a lot, means I've got a bit of graduation there, which is fine for me, quite like that. I'm keeping quite a long distance from it too, so that I don't put an awful lot on. I think I mentioned in a previous video that um, just a bit of concentration needed there. When I'm doing these projects like this uh, for the streaming, I do take probably more time than I would do. 
airbrushing these if I was doing it myself. I'm kind of taking an awful long time to do quite a small piece of terrain. But um, I'm quite happy to do that because I'll end up with a good result in the end and, and it encourages me to keep on going with the, uh, the job really. So this has had a lot of overspray, this one, from the spraying underneath. So this is going to tidy that up to give it a nice darker blue along the bottom. Oh, went on a bit heavy there. And that's where you can get quite subtle graduation with, a, with an airbrush around the edge of that. No idea how I'm going to get into that one. I'm going to try. So just hold the card there and spray in and pray. And that sort of worked. Yeah, at this stage I want to try and avoid more overspray onto other things because um, I'm nearly done with the airbrushing, so... I definitely don't want to go back on. There's two here that are obvious candidates on the end. I will surprise myself how far away you can be and still seemingly get quite a narrow bit of coverage. You do get overspray, but... Right. It is done. I think the only thing I'm going to do is possibly just do a really sort of subtle difference on the tops just to again add some gradation and difference weather bleaching or something not a great deal just enough to sort of stop it looking like one big color this one in particular looks like it could do with some one flat color surface breaks it up a bit. Well, this is the first time we've had proper reuse of this colour because I now can punch some of this uh, blue into this. Oops, gone on too strong there. and around the front of the workshop. This is hard to get into that gap. This is where a pro modeler would have uh, not put this on the base yet.
Yeah, that's enough variation for me on there. No, oh, there's no real re there's nothing on this one that needs it. So again, there's some blue in the bottom. But it's going, going gone. Right. Just going to take a break from the airbrush for a moment. I'm back. I'm a bit low on the stair, on the chair. Oh. Oof. Got quite hot over there, and um, but feel quite successful. I've got quite a long way through those. What I've got down here are some airbrush stencils. That's kind of a hex shape. Um, I quite like the idea of putting some of those on the side of the building, just to sort of sci-fi it up a bit. If you don't want to buy these that are um, TT Combat do these snappy stencils, um, you can also buy just aluminium sheeting, Amazon do it like this, and you could uh, get some of that on, um, on Amazon and the spray on it, but you could also use it as part of the building if you're constructing a building and you wanted to make one of the surface panels look interesting, it's fantastic for that. So yeah, a bit of hassle getting this. So these are uh, obviously acrylic sheets that I've had cut into shapes. And I have an idea to um, uh, build these into sort of boxes for terrain. And one of the things I was thinking of doing is using this kind of material to break up the surface for in a sci-fi sort of way. So that would be glued on. You know, I might put window details cut into there as well but um, I would do that as part of that project. So these are really cheap sheets. I can't remember what I paid for them, but I've had them in this sort of collection for a couple of years. Um, oh yeah, alternative, oh John, alternative media for the airbrush. Yes, there's all sorts of different things you can pump through an airbrush, enamels, acrylics, uh, alcohol-based paints as well, inks, proper inks. Um, so yeah, that's an idea I've got. So I'm gonna probably spray through that in a minute on those pieces to add some interesting bits to them. Uh, this is another project, I've got lots of these and I've actually got the special glue needed to glue acrylic together. So you know the stuff you use on Games Workshop plastic, uh, it doesn't work on this acrylic because it's too tough, but if you buy the uh, super glue, it's not super glue actually, but it's just kind of a super weld stuff, um, you need to use it outside, don't want to breathe it in, it will weld these sheets together and you can make boxes from those and then terrain. So that's another project I've got in mind. And this is an example of how I'd glue it together. Um, so yeah, I would, I've got this little cheap frame as well. It's just a few quid from Amazon. And then you put the two panels together. And then if I use that special glue I mentioned, which I, when I do a video on it, I will share the, the, the knowledge, the wise sage knowledge on the kind of glue. Uh, which you can put a, a bead down there and it will literally weld those pieces together and help you build a, uh, a full terrain piece. So acrylic, acrylic's great stuff for that. 
Um, but I've never built train using acrylic before. I've always used this MDF stuff, but this is going to be interesting. I think I mentioned before, everything I do, um, I sort of build up detail on. So I mean, on this one, I've only added these containers on the top, but on the other stations, I've put quite a lot of extra detail on. So there you can see that sort of blue contrast, and this is going to get weathered. So all that will tone down. It's not going to look so uh, bright on there. Uh, it's just it's handy to go on with a bright colour because if you're going to do any chipping and darkening, if you start with a brighter colour, it will uh, tone down nicely. And you can see really the orange has only kind of given a tint to the the red sections there as well. Um, the next stage for this, as I was saying, is I'm going to put the yellow on, on this, so it's a bright yellow then. And then probably spray a dark grey all over the, the concrete base. While I would do that, I would hold a mask up here because I don't want to spray up a dark thing. But it doesn't, it's not actually the end of the world. If you go along there with a dark grey near, near black to, to finish the uh, concrete areas, if you do get a bit of spray up, it just darkens around the bottom. Again, it doesn't in the whole grand scheme of things. When this is on a table played for playing uh, for terrain, uh, that's not a big deal. So, yeah, you can see a sort of vehicle in there as well, 15 mil scale. Have a look at EPVC for building material. It should be cheaper than acrylic. Yeah, acrylic's actually quite cheap now. Um, I just think there's so many plastics in the world. The EPVC. Is that the white sheet? Is that the styrene sheet? I don't know. So on this one, you can see again, I've darkened around the edge. Um, it's just given that tone. And when this has had a wash and weathering detail and blackening and chipping, that will again bring that out nicely. And the doors on the back now sort of go up from the darker color at the bottom. And the, you can see where I, I sprayed that yellow on there. Probably need to do something around that door. It's all gone a bit yellowish. Uh, but again, if it's weathered and this is painted, it'll, it'll snap it all back together because um, it's not the finished article until it's all weathered. One thing I tend to do, which is part of when I do the dark spray on the base to get rid of the overspray and, and, and neaten the whole thing up, is I will also put a little frame around the windows uh, plastic card frame and then spray the dark colour on those uh, that leading in there as well so that's the other thing I do so yeah it's looking good really done anything extra on the roofs they're, they're done really they just obviously they're not done finished uh, but they're done as far as airbrushing is concerned on there um, although oh, I'm going to do a yellow on that hatch I forgot about that I am going to that yellow which I'm going to do on the the skips uh, the trash cans I'm going to do that on there as well just to sort of bring that up I know it's looking reasonable at the moment but just one extra color on that roof yellow will go quite nicely with the green um, and it just draws the eye in so you can see there's a hatch there Yes. I mean, if you're interested in this and this is the first time you've seen one of these videos, I did do one of these on the masking. So it's in the Grunts uh, page and on the Rotten Lid uh, gaming YouTube channel as well. I went through how I mask these and put the tape on. That was an earlier video. So I think that's me. Um, had a reasonable break. Um, I do have another one of these. I, I picked this up at Salute this year. Anarchy Models, Hex Grid Small Mini. These are probably the best for the job because um, they're flexible. You can fit it onto a flat surface. You can push on it like that, quick spray, and it doesn't matter that some of this is sort of hanging away there. I can spray onto there, and it's going to give me a good grid. So actually, I'm going to use that. That I'm going to use as building material, as I mentioned before, on the side of, uh, on the side of a uh, building wall.
I did pick up a few of these. There's another one they've got, which is a dragon scale kind of style. A micro diamond grid, that's useful on dragons and things if you want to airbrush through. Anarchy models again. And then I got a really tiny hex grid. And you can see how much they are. These are quite expensive. Um, so it was a bit of an indulgence at Salute this year. But I thought I'm going to reuse them. And they've made them from a material that you can wash and clean. So when the paint's built up, you can clean them up. And they do them as like a set. Um, yeah. So I think I'm going to use that one. Uh, I'm not going to use the diamond. I'm going to use this one to do some hex shapes on the side of those buildings by using a contrasting colour on the lighter um, elevations of the building. If you've a local signage firm, they may let you have cut-offs for free. Yeah, that's the other thing with um, acrylic. You can sort of find cut-offs around where people have used them. Um, so just zoom into this so you can see. Um, I've used it before, so you can see some of the paint on there and how you'd, you'd lay it on a vehicle or something, spray through, and you're getting that sci-fi hex pattern on there. So that's what I wanted to dig out and have a quick break. Um, Oh, zooming out and uh, just switch back up to this one and that's me. So I'm going to head back over to the airbrush over there and I think my sound's got an issue over there so I'm going to have to work on that in the next video so you may find I'm a bit quieter over there but I'll shout <laughs> and hopefully people will hear that when I'm uh, streaming. So off I go now. 28 more comments. Let's have a look what's come through on the comments. Great techniques from John, thank you. And thanks to everybody else for, for signing in there. Um, so right, switching off this mic and switching back to the other mic. I'm back and hopefully you can see me. Uh, there's that uh, stencil I'm going to use. I'm going to start with that yellow I mentioned, just a small amount of yellow. Just this colour, yellow. Some airbrush blow improver first, just a few drops, don't need much. Then on with the yellow. And hopefully I've shaken it up enough. Shouldn't need much of that at all. Managed to get it on my finger. Then the usual concoction of a little bit of the Mecca gloss varnish which thins up the yellow, um, makes it more transparent, plus it makes it glossier, which is better for the weathering, and then more of the flow enhancer to mix it all together. And then a cocktail stick to mix the concoction up. So this should be a very thin, transparent layer. see that I'm getting the yellow through there. There it goes. So right, I'm going to need to mask that. It's handy that that tucks just behind the uh, skip. can see again the darker areas that I didn't put the, the tan colour on underneath are, are meaning that the transparent yellow is leaving that shadow behind.
working a bit blind there. Um, one yellow skip. I might just go on the edge of these yellow ones here as well. Okay, that's all the yellow I want on there. And what other very tiny piece of yellow required on here in this area? Paint hits the deck. So there you go, two kind of yellowy skips to stand out. I'm not going to do anything else in yellow. So I'm going to pump this out. Just need to get myself a new tissue. Right, next. Well, I'm going to do the dark grey now. I'm going to use this uh, German grey, which is quite a dark grey, to do the base. So I will need a lot of this because I've got all the bases to spray. Plus I'm going to use a bit of it through here because I'm going to double up the usage of the colour to just spray some of these hexagons on the side of some of the lighter areas of the buildings to add interest. So I'm giving this a very good German grey shake because I know I'm going to use a lot in the airbrush. So start off with the thinner, a few drops in the bottom, German grey, Ooh, there's a lot gone in there, so I may not need it all, but we'll see how I get on. A lot of the varnish. A little bit more thinner to keep it all moving. And then find myself a stick. To give it a good stirring. That's it, it's loaded. Oh dear. <laughs> That's why you need the lid. Got a bit overexcited. Lucky it wasn't on the model.
and my fingers are covered in it. But it's spraying out nice and clear and clean, so I'm ready for the models. So I could probably do with a larger piece of card. But I mentioned earlier these decals have arrived and they're in these convenient envelopes. I'm going to, since they're to hand, I'm going to use that as a mask. Also see some rubbish built up in there, some bits of dust and things. Obviously these are much larger areas, but you can see, hopefully you can see it's cleaned up already that edge um, at the bottom where I had overspray. I'm still sort of leaving areas that uh, I'm not giving it a full-on blast, which means, like for example here, the darker primer that had gone on underneath is left sort of showing through on some of the edges. It just leaves it looking a bit uneven. Sometimes you do need a smaller card as well. Oh, don't touch that. Now I've lost my my trusty piece of card. But I'll just keep on going. Well, here's a tricky patch. Just along those edges there. I think that's nearly done. I think that's neatly cleaned up really. And anything else, um, anything else will be cleaned up with the weathering. There's a little bit left on the end there.
Yeah, that's clean enough to me for a wargaming grade. Oh dear. Lost the lid, nearly lost the paint. Well, hopefully this one will be a little bit easier because uh, it's larger and lighter. Oh dear, that's why I needed the lid, and I shouldn't have let that lid go flying. I've got so much paint, it's going all over the shop. This is what happens when you're live. I found the lid, I found the lid. And now a minor amount of recovery re required on the splats that fill out the top of the reservoir. And of course they'll just have to look like oil stains, I'll weather over those later. So there's no harm in, in the odd little uh, error like that. And of course I can also blend them in. Right, along the front, details. Yeah, this one's a lot easier to manoeuvre because it's a lot lighter. Yeah, it's rather hot this weekend in the UK, uh, which is why I shun the light and come inside to do airbrushing. So that's looking quite clean there. I need to do that edge.
Yeah, just going in the windows. I'm not going to mask them because I'm just doing it in a rush now. So don't mind the overspray really. And the same with these windows. I think I'd already sprayed some up here. In the Somehow I managed to get a cobweb across there. It takes me so long to do these that colonies of spiders have moved in in between painting. Right. The last one for this uh, groundwork. Must be really exciting to watch, but uh, you know, I thought I'd record the whole thing for prosperity. Oops, almost dropped everything everywhere. You know, where it looks a little bit uneven, I'm either not bothered or I might just go back over. Now, do I even bother masking this side? I think I will. So it puts it out of the frame for a moment, but uh, that's that done. So this is kind of grey all around the bottom here already, so it's not, uh, it's not a lot to get on with there. Most of these windows are already grey. Right, so now the masking. 
So where do I put it? I've dropped the mask. So I think I think some masking along the top here. This sort of adds a bit of detail to the edge of the building without uh, overdoing it. You don't want a whole building looking like a zebra or a hexra or whatever you want to call it. Put some on the corner of the container down here too. And possibly just up on the top of the other side there, just on the corner of the building again. Yeah, that's probably enough. You know, I'm sorely tempted to go down here to So this is feeling good, I'm right at the end now. So a couple of little bits more masking on here. Might do some on these doors, just on the edge, or maybe, yeah, yeah, no, I'll just do it on the white. Oh, I think that's it for the airbrush. Now that is it, that's as far as I'm going on the airbrush. Over to detailing then. I'm going to turn, oh no, I'm not going to turn this off yet. Let's get this out of the way. Oh yeah, every yard needs a big stain. Uh, I've worked with some of those over the years as well. So this is a pleasing moment. I mean, this airbrush needs a deep clean soon, but I'm just going to obviously clean it out before I uh, head back over and get that dark grey out. Yeah, what doesn't pour out, I uh, spray out. You get to see me clean my airbrush. This thrilling, thrilling, thrilling material. Um, but if you want to look up close as well, I mean, here's how messy the crown has got. So there's a lot of stuff in there that needs cleaning off. Yeah, lots of cleaning to do, basically. But I'll do that later, I'll not do that now. So that's that done. It's now airbrushed.
and um, I shall turn this machine off and you'll hear that winding down now just as I turn it off That's better. That's better. Sorry, you probably couldn't hear me while I was whining about being hot um, because the mic was off. So the airbrushing's done and you can see them all piled on the center console over there. I'll drag it over to me and uh, we'll have a look at what's been going on. If I can zoom into this locally. You can see how everything's been sort of cleaned up in terms of the whole base is now kind of uniform color. Um, although it's still drying, although I didn't go into covering everything. So it looks a little bit broken up. When I did these uh, on the other uh, bases of these that I've done recently, I did sort of just highlight the odd edge of a slab just to add more detail, which I'll do by brush on these. So really today, not a great deal done except for they're sort of finished in terms of the airbrushing phase and obviously as I've mentioned before they have the uh, removable lids on there so that looks a little bit more interesting with the uh, with the lid in place with the roof in place even although I've put it on the wrong way around I think not that it really matters oh I was going to do yellow wasn't I on that um, on that, but I'll, I'll paint it, or I might not bother. I might leave it in keeping with the rest of the roof. There's enough bright stuff on there standing out as it is. You can see the hex mask has gone there neatly. Uh, I didn't want to go overboard on that. So I've put some on the edge of that container and on the edge of the building up there too, just to sort of add interest really. So that's ready for the sort of weathering and painting stage. And any decal, water slide decals I want to put on. And uh, here we have the nice bright yellow skip, which will take some sort of chipping and weathering. And what else was done on here? I mean, really, it was just cleaned up again, wasn't it? It's ready for weathering, it's looking quite smart now. At least I think, anyway. <laughs> and the other one, which has got the little stairs in. Is now also cleaned up and ready for washes and weathering to tone it all down and uh, bring it all together making it look a little less bright and a little bit more rusty and worn in is what's required next you know what I will do is things like I'll, I'll weather these vents put stains running down the wall I need to paint in these images um, and if you can see but there's a there's a logo saying lab on there in fact on the door there's like a a little hand as well with that kind of no entry kind of hand on it that needs to be done so yeah quite pleased with progress 
And as I mentioned earlier, for the uh, for this stuff, um, the water slide decals, I'm going to put these on those containers before I start the weathering. So that's really probably the next thing I will do, is I'll put some of these guys on and uh, basically it'll be like a probably, I think I've probably got a good hour to two hours of putting decals on all over the various different containers and, and, and locations and that will really um, bring the model together as well, bring the three models together cleanly. So, I'm going to take a break now because how long have I been going? Um, how long have I been streaming? I'm going to find out. He finally says, a look at the live dashboard. It's been one hour 38. So I'm going to have a coffee, I'm going to have a break, and then I'm going to probably come back and put those decals on. Wash my hands that have become blackened with uh, airbrush and just uh, cool down a bit after that airbrushing, making me rather warm. And... Uh, Oh, there's one other thing I will just flip to, just in this moment. So, I had prepared earlier just a view on the Cerisa website where you can see the uh, those are the little warehouses that I'm painting there. £15 each, these are. So, that's how they've done them. Um, as I say, I did sort of punch that darker colour in there. They've done it a kind of a metal work. I've gone with a, a reddish colour on there. In fact, that's done really well. That's really weathered in, doesn't it? Mine isn't going to look quite as, as beaten up as that. And obviously, I'm not going to have these yellowed corner pieces because... I hid my MDF joints because I put a bit of plastic card down that both on all the corners. So it just disguised the sort of MDF nature of what's in there. In fact, once it's all weathered up and complete, it won't look very MDF at all. It's all going to just look quite uniform, I think. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do, which they haven't done, um, is I'm going to put uh, plastic behind all of these so that they look shiny. So as I'll have a piece of uh, clear perspex behind or acetate, I think you call it, the, the, the plastic. So that's going to go in there as a final stage after all the weathering and painting's done. Um, and that means that um, just as you move it, the light will catch off there and it will look, it'll add some, add some realism to that. Yeah, so you can see they haven't put any glass in, but I'll put that plastic inside. And that's why I didn't glue the lids of the roofs on. Um, because I want to be able to get in and as a final stage put that uh, plastic and glue that inside. Uh, the other thing I've been looking at again recently is um, actually on the Cer uh, Cerisa site here there's some nice other new ones that I hadn't noticed before. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen that movie Battle Angel but there's quite a few sort of old style buildings in it like these but with potentially with tubes and pipe work and everything kind of hanging out of it. So I quite like the look of these um, chateau, and again, a good price. It's 15 mil, 17, 18 pounds, really. I think you could sci-fi this up with some interesting containers. You could use the top as a, a fire point. Yeah, I'm not rushing out to get it, though, but I just quite like the look of that. Going back into my archive in Google Photos, these are from Ainsty, and I built this before I moved to this house, so sort of 10 plus years ago, I built these Ainsty um, down below space station kind of layout. And uh, it's a rather nice um, terrain piece. And as you can see, we've this is from Old Crow, this little um, car workshop. I gave everything a, a, an airbrush here as well, this kind of weathered style. And I made quite, oh, that's not the same one. So if I can go back. No, wrong one. There it is again. And you can see how the airbrushing up against the edges sort of gave the weathered look to it, including there's some extra washes and pigments I used on there too in this airlocked area. The whole idea of the game was that it was airlocked, so we had sort of no atmosphere outside. Um, so it was quite a fun game, 15 mil, that was many years ago. But on the subject of Ainsty, all of these walls that they've got here, they are in the down below range. So this is Ainsty castings, they're all resin, and they're down below range. As you can see with a normal 
um, 28 mil model uh, up against that's not a very good picture is it but up against the walls they are taller than these down below walls because they're deliberately made shorter now I happen to know the guy that originally modeled these he was another Robin like me He's, he was a guy called Robin Hill and um, he made these deliberately so that you could get your hand into the corridors but he was a 28 mil 30 mil gamer um, but he thought I'll do lower walls because I mean when you're gaming with it um, you can grab the models easily like you see here the walls are lower than the than the model so that was his design principle and that's why I used it for my um, my grunts games because I thought for 15 mil it's perfect they're not too high up and they're uh, they're looking sharp and my whole um, plan for salute that we're going to do at the war game show next year is I'm going to use more of the ancient terrain from their various ranges and I'm going to sort of scale it for 15 mil so I'm going to use some of their um, floor panels and pipe works and various other skywalk is another one that they do I think over here is their skywalk skywalk so they have these nice raised platforms so I've got a few of these things and they scale well for 15 mil I mean that ramp on this particular walk um, works for anything um, it just it's just a bigger rampway for 15 mil it doesn't have to be um, accurate to a narrow walkway for 15 mil in fact that's a very narrow walkway isn't it for a 28 mil character it's not got much room either side but for 15 mil you could get a squad running up there quite comfortably or a vehicle if you're building it into the terrain layout so definitely fantastic um, fantastic stuff from Ainsty and a really quick way to build models with detail because everything they do comes with floor plate detail details underneath um, so you're already your job's done for you already before you start airbrushing it and if I switch back now again you can see how I integrated Ainsty terrain on here this is from Ainsty like a little walkway underneath there um, this is a step up from Ainsty as well here and obviously it looks appropriate in 28 mil but I've scaled it for 15, brought the scale down by using obviously it's a 15 mil terrain box to start with but also a, a 15 mil door from Ground Zero Games and then I've put these little bits of gubbins and bits that I've, I've cut and I've put those widgety bits on just to bring it all in line with looking a bit more 15 mil um, so yes, and you can get away with the 28mm resin terrain on here too. And then obviously these containers are from the Scene UK. And some of these sort of detailed roof bits here are, that's a Ground Zero Games metal piece and that's a Ground Zero Games piece from the side of one of their buildings I just had in a, in a box for years. So just used it up to add a little extra piece of detail on there. So that was really just a final comment to say, you know, multi-scaling is fine. You can find stuff that will work in multiple scales for you. Um, and in fact, I think when I do the, um, when I build my Ainsty kit, I've got a, a load of it's arrived. So I won't go through it now, but it's all, it's all going to be prepared for the uh, Salute Show next April. So it gives me quite a while to get it done, doesn't it? Um, that is going to be probably built in a way where I can make it modular on these tiles like I've done here but also multi-scale so I might be able to make it so it will work for 28 mil so if I've got some skywalk pieces on here that you know potentially I could even have a similar base here with a, a raised skywalk so people could sort of hop between uh, a building and, and the whole uh, terrain layout lifts up a little bit in terms of having some dynamic up and uh, higher ground areas but I might make it so that I could use it for 28 mil as well but I'll see how that goes on because really I want to scale it for the one true scale 15 mil so there we go So I think I mentioned I'm going to take a break now because I'm all hot and worn out and I'm coming back later to do the decals on these. So that may be this evening, maybe tomorrow. But thanks very much if you've listened in. This has been one hour, 50 minutes almost of me doing the airbrushing. Hopefully it looks okay through the camera. So thanks for watching. And next time I'll be down here 
which means there'll be less noise from the airbrush and uh, I'll be doing the detailing so everything will be a little bit easier to see and less of that clumsy me moving things around to airbrush which tends to obscure the, uh, the job sometimes. Whew, there we go. Goodbye. Thanks for watching.